So God, so what's crazy is, you know, we respond to the Lord by faith. So before you even heard the word, you actually responded in faith to doing what God wanted to have done in your life in the altars. And so, some of you, this isn't going to be anything new to you. And if it's not, then you need to hear this again. And for those of you who it is new, may you cultivate it in your life to further the kingdom of God. So if you have your Bibles tonight, we'll be in the book of Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. We're going to read verse 1 through 20. I just love the Lord. And I love how he just so graciously meets with us. And just does something new every time we gather here. So if you Mark chapter 4, if you would, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? I'll be reading now the New American Standard Version of the Bible. It says, he began to teach again by the sea and such a very large crowd gathered to him and he got into the boat in the sea and sat down. And the whole crowd was by the sea on the land and he was teaching them many things in parables and was saying to them in his teaching, listen to this, behold the sower went out to sow. As he was sowing, some feed, seed fell among beside the road and the birds came up and ate it. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil and immediately it sprang up and because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it. Everybody say, choked it. Choked it. And choked it and yielded no crop. Other seeds fell into good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. And he was saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And as soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables. And he was saying to them, To you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, get everything in parables, so that while seeing they may see and not perceive, while hearing they may hear and not understand, otherwise they might return and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? Let me pause right there. The key to understanding all the parables is unlocked through Mark chapter 4 in the parable of the sower. Verse 14. The sower sows the word. These are the ones who are beside the road where the word is sown. And then they hear immediately Satan comes and takes the word which has been sown in them. In a similar way, these are the ones on whom the seed was sown on the rocky places who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy and they have no firm root in themselves but are only temporary. Then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones whom the seed was sown among the thorns and these are the ones who have heard the word but the worries of the world, the deceitfulness of the riches, the desires for other things enter in and choke. Everybody say choke. choke. And choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And those are the ones whom the seed was sown on the good soil. And they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. I want to go back to verse 18 and 19 and read that again to you tonight. And others are the ones whom the seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word. But the worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word. And it becomes unfruitful. Tonight, I want to preach on a stranglehold on revival revisited. Part one. Lift your hands to the Lord. Lord, I thank you that by faith the stranglehold has already been uprooted. But God, now you give understanding and wisdom in that understanding. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 You may be seated. 
Jesus taught in parables. If you're wondering what a parable is, it's nothing more than a story that is told in relation to what takes place in the natural earthly realm that you and I see right here. This is a physical, natural, fleshly, earthly realm where we can see, touch, taste, feel. Everything that goes on in the natural, Jesus would tell a story about a natural occurrence. And then from that natural occurrence, there would be mystery. There would be secrets hidden in that story. He would teach in these parables often. And Jesus, whenever the disciples came to Jesus and wanted to know, why do you speak to them in parables? He said to them, to you it has been given the mystery of the kingdom. My question to you tonight is why would Jesus be so obscure in revealing the things of the kingdom? Why would Jesus... Bring something forth that would create mystery or secrecy or this obscurity where it wouldn't make things clear. No, if Jesus, if you really want us to know something, why don't you just tell us? Some of you have been in that place. God, why don't you just tell me your will for my life and I'll do it. And then you hear nothing and you wonder, what is God's will for my life? Why does God not just always jump right to the point with things? Because mystery and secrets must be searched out. God does not reveal the things of the kingdom to the casual seeker. He only reveals things to those who go beyond the surface. The parable was a surface thing. That gave an invitation to go deeper. Listen to this, y'all. How you respond to what God reveals determines what you see next. Jesus told the crowd and his disciples the parable. But who came to Jesus seeking more? Wanting the understanding, wanting to go deeper. It was the disciples. So what happened is he explained the parables to the disciples, but to the crowd that was casually just wanting to find out what this man of God had to say, they didn't get the understanding. Why? Because God does not reveal him. Listen, you have to take what God reveals to you, obey it, do something with it, or God doesn't give you any more. Did you know that every person, some of y'all need to listen to this real clearly, Every person on the earth has a revelation of God. Every single person. Even those who have never heard about Jesus have a revelation of who God is. The Bible tells us there's two ways that God has revealed himself to mankind. The first one is through creation. Read Romans 1. It's right there. Through creation, through the things that have been made, God has revealed his invisible attributes. And then the second way that God has revealed himself to everyone is through the conscience that's been given. It's the conscience, conscience, with knowledge that bears witness with God's law written on the heart. So people see God in nature, and then there's an inner witness that when they do wrong, they know it's wrong because God's given them a conscience that lets them know. So there's a witness, but here's the thing. How can God send people to hell who have never heard of Jesus? Because he has given them surface revelation of himself. And only those who say, I see you, God, in creation, and I feel the inner witness. I believe you're there. God is only going to reveal Jesus to those who come into agreement with the revelation that's already been given. Amen. So if somebody sees creation and somebody feels the witness of their conscience but rejects that revelation, then God is under no obligation to give them a re- revelation of who he is in his son, which is Jesus. Man, that is good. So guess what? How you respond to revelation determines what you see next. Amen. Amen. So here Jesus comes with this parable of disciples. They come to them, him and then he gives them the understanding of the kingdom. Everybody say kingdom. kingdom. The parables are about the kingdom. Jesus came preaching the, the gospel of the kingdom. Right. Mm-hmm. We have 
to remember that we are kingdom people. Amen. We are a part of the kingdom of God. And we must be careful to not build our kingdom, our denomination, our ministry, our brand, my name. You know what I love? It's Pastor Richie Willis. If you don't know Pastor Richie, he's the one that gets loud praise, and I love that about him. Okay? What's crazy is, you know, most pastors they hear about, you know, because you know, when I was traveling full time, Pastor Richie had me once or twice a year, and then here's this evangelist that's preached at his church has now got a gathering, a revival gathering in another church. And you know what? The first public Sunday that we had from his pulpit, he announced to his church, y'all know evangelist great. He done started a church. We going over there tonight. He brought a whole crew. That's kingdom people. There ain't many pastors that do that. So I honor you. Don't y'all give Pastor Rich in here. So what happened is we remember that we are advancing the kingdom. He was even had his phone up there on Facebook Live. He's he's doing a I don't know how you got signal there, brother. I can't get signal in there for Facebook Live. But he's in there, and I heard him walk by, and I was going up in the sound booth to check on something. I heard him say, see, right now, this is a move of God. This is Pastor Granny's church, right? And he's like, he's like, yeah, I need to come on out. I'm like, there ain't many people who do that. So what you have to remember is he has the understanding that this isn't me or mine. This is something that the kingdom Amen. is circulating. It's interesting that our ministry team before the service was praying and there was Brother Kevin Caldwell start praying against the jealousy in ministries and ministers to one another. And we have to get on the level of the kingdom. And Jesus not only taught about the kingdom in the parables, but when he began to preach, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does that mean? It's done reach right now. It's tangible. It's right now. The kingdom is at hand. And what's interesting, before he told him the kingdom was at hand, he gave the command to repent, which is the Greek word metanoia. It means to change the way you think. Why do we have to change the way we think? Because if we stay with our mindset of what God did yesterday, we can't accept what God's trying to do today to advance his kingdom and so there's this repent you know times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord when there's what in the people of God there's repentance repentance proceeds times of refreshing it proceeds revival and then so Jesus has been preaching this repentance message for the kingdom of heaven is at hand then he gets to this parable at the sower and seed and let me just tell you this that the kingdom in seed form is revival. I'm going to say it again. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. The kingdom in seed form is revival. Revival simply means a couple different things. It means to take that which is dead and make it alive again. Come on. Amen. It also means to take something that is new. There's this concept that you can have Christianity people, the normal ones, and then have revival. When actually, if you really dig into Scripture, the concepts don't do this. They actually do this. They go hand in hand. Because when Jesus brings you into salvation, he's taking somebody that was dead and bringing them into life. And even after that salvation experience, you are in a process of always, day by day, being made new again. We need those times of refreshing. We need those renewing moments. You know, I've been getting into some podcasts and doing some study, and I was even talking with Pastor or Evangelist Chad McDonald last week when he was here, and we spent some time driving around Hot Springs and looking at some stuff, and he was, we were talking about the concept of the old wineskin. And look at the old wineskin being what God did yesterday. We got to toss that aside. But actually the context of a new wineskin 
Actually, it doesn't mean it's like brand new. Like you can go pick it off the shelf at the store and you had something that was brand new off the shelf. No, a new wine, an old wine skin could be made new again through a renewal process. When Jesus talked about not putting old, new wine into old wine skins, what he was saying is you can't put something into an, the old wine skin was a wine skin that was dried up, was brittle, and you had to take it through where you had to rub it down with oil, yeah. you had to saturate it with water, and repeat that process till it can begin to be stretched again. So even though you've been in the kingdom for a while and you've been a part of what God did yesterday, if you'll saturate yourself in the oil and in the water that God's wanted right. to sit in his presence and soak that up, then we can begin to be made elastic again so when he pours out new wine we don't waste what he pours out see we are in this revival see revival is also is, is, is this concept of being dead and alive again it has to be made new over and over again renewal process and so all that renewal process that renewal lifestyle is the kingdom in seed form when Jojo came. What is the one thing you heard him say a lot about? Your mind set. You listen to his podcast, Kingdom Mindset. Why do we have people like Jojo and Joyce Meyer writing books about the battlefield of the mind? Do you know where the battle is? Do you know what? Because repentance, that Greek word repent, metanoia, change the way you think. Where does the enemy come and attack you? If he can get you to believe something that's not true here, he's got you in a stronghold. And you repeat the process. So God is trying to get us to repent, to break through that mindset so that we can be in a process of being made new. And that process is something that's never ending. And that in itself, that repentance, that renewing is the kingdom in seed form. So here Jesus is preaching a teaching a parable that has to do with a sower sowing seed. What is the seed? It's the thing that you need planted in your life to change the way you think. The word, the gospel that we preach, it is a revival message. It's not like, well, he's a revival preacher. This is this it all combined. You can't separate. It's the DNA. Is, you know, we, we use the term revival. We think about Browns and all these different things that we've termed revival. We're really, it's supposed to be a lifestyle, not just an event. Come on. And the reason why we've had revivals in and come to a close and people go back to normal is because the mindset must be shifted to understand that the revival that needs to happen in the earth cannot be just an event, but it must be a continual process from now till Jesus comes to set up his kingdom on the earth. And so here Jesus is teaching this gospel of the kingdom, this message of revival here in Mark chapter 4. And so the seed is being sown, the revival is being sown, and the, the seed is the gospel of the kingdom, the word that brings the renewal, the repentance in our lives. And it's being planted in different types of ground. The ground is nothing more than your heart. And Jesus said there are some where the seed of revival is sown and immediately Satan comes and snatches it up. Gone, just like that. No chance to take root. The road was very hard. It, it, the seed, the reason why the birds were able to come and snatch it is because was, it was so downtrodden and so packed down that the seed, even though if it got a little rain, it had nothing to grab a hold of to take root. And so the birds would be able to come and eat it up. Sometimes our hearts are so hardened because of all the things that have downtrodden us through the years. When Jesus comes... And the seed of sown, the enemies just taking you for easy pickings. Then there's those who were sown, the seed of revival sown among those who have rocky soil. And as a kid, I used to wonder how, what's the difference between the road and rocky soil? Because it's both hard, right? Well, you have to understand the concept and the context of what rocky soil meant in Jesus' day. It wasn't that there was like, a bunch of rocks on top of the ground or it was mixed with the ground, so to speak. 
But there was this, what they considered rocky soil was the soil where there was just a, maybe a couple inches of soil like this. And then underneath the soil was this hard bedrock. And what would happen when the seed was sown, sown on that soil, that shallow soil, that we know is the rocky soil, whenever the roots would take root in the shallow soil, then when the sun and the elements come against it, it would try to grow, and it feel the heat of the sun, the roots would try to go down deep to find moisture, and couldn't find moisture. Why? Because it would hit a rock. And because it couldn't go down deep to get moisture, the sun of affliction and temptation would cause it to fade away. Listen, you can't have a shallow relationship with God and last. That's right. That's right. This come, pray a prayer, and go live the way you want to is shallow. Yeah. Just the only time you spend in time with God is on Sunday nights at 5 at Revival Hub. Amen. Let me tell you why we do what we do, why we go so long. is because we've been in this mindset, this vicious cycle. And you, I've experienced it because you, you know you've experienced it. Where you seem to get caught up in the rat race of the week. Oh, and you yeah. didn't slow down long enough to hear God. It's like when you first start worship, it's like nobody's really into it. And it, just, it takes us a while to break through because we've been through this week where we're not accustomed to the presence of God. And God has to break through and so he's what he's doing is he's breaking up that fallow oh, ground and he's right, even beginning right. to expose the shallowness of our relationship and so tonight if you feel like you're in that cycle and you know you've been in that cycle don't walk out of here under the condemnation of the devil rejoice that God's already dealt with that and God's exposing it for what it is and is sending you out here to not have a shallow relationship with God but so that you can let God go deep in your life Amen. Amen. Is this speaking to anybody tonight? Yes. Then there's the third soil where we know is the soil where the <laughs> seed was sown among the thorns. The thorns choked it out. I'm going to come back to that one because I want to touch on the fourth one real quick. The fourth one is where there was much depth of soil. There was no weeds or thorns to choke out anything. Mm, come on. And it produced a crop. Hey! But let's go back to third category because I really believe that most of the people in this room, the fight and the battle is in the area of category number three. The seed is sown and the Bible says that the thorns or the weeds choke it out. Can I tell you that choke is a violent term? It speaks to a violent competition for life. Many of you know that my son wrestles. And he is only 12, ladies and gentlemen. And he wrestled in the toughest tournament in the nation this last week. Only been wrestling for two years. He won one match. He lost two. And his coach told him yesterday, he says, huh. You won one yesterday? Yes, sir. And that's something. Sometimes it takes people wrestling years before they ever win at this tournament. And I remember when he started last year, he went to this novice tournament, and he hooks these guys. He does something called the cradle. Gets the arm up behind their head, and the other arm around the leg, and he hooks it, boy. And he get, they, they cannot get out. And I remember he's at that novice tournament, and he won his first match. He cradled this guy, pinned him. The next guy he pinned, he ended up winning the thing. And he came to me after that second match and said, Dad, I almost let go of that cradle in that second match. He said, why? Because that guy started grunting. You know why that guy was grunting? He wasn't getting no air. He was choking. You know what his said? Boy, don't you ever think about letting go. Choke him out. <laughs> Show no mercy. It wasn't that he had him around the neck. What he did is just, he was compressing his abdomen where he couldn't breathe. It was restricting the airflow. Choke, it's violent. If you've ever been involved in, if you've ever been, you know, sent, hurt out people in domestic abuse and being choked is a violent thing. It's not something that's just kind of casual, like you're, 
No, it's, it's serious. Well, the word choke there in the Greek is the Greek word sumnigo. I hope I said that right. For the theologians in the house and the ones who will watch this on YouTube, um, email me, I guess. Whatever you want to say. Send the hate mail. But, but sumnigo, this is what it means. It means to strangle completely. It can even mean literally to drown. Or figuratively, to crowd out. Most of us would say that we want God, but the truth is there is no room in our lives. There's things that crowd Him out, that choke out what He's planted in us. Can I tell you the devil doesn't play fair. He does not play nice. He will come for you. Thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That doesn't sound like playing fair or nice. He plays for keeps. He's coming for the jugular. But notice this. The devil's not the one that does the strangling or the choking of revival in your life. There is a three-corded strand that is not easily broken that's already planted in your life that chokes out revival. The thing that chokes out revival is already in our hearts and they have to be uprooted. It comes from within. We say, well, the devil made me do it. The devil's got this. The devil tempted me. He only plays on what's already inside of you. You have to understand it has to be uprooted. And there's three areas, a three-corded strand that's not easily broken that puts a stranglehold on personal and corporate revival from being fruitful in your life. The first one the Bible says here is the worries or the cares of this life. Jesus said, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat, drink, what you'll wear. Matter of fact, he said, who of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? What does that mean? It's a phrase, cubit of stature. Your stature is your height. How do you by worrying you want to grow? But the phrase means more than just your height. It really meant you by worrying and letting your wheels turn, is it really going to make your life any better or make you live any longer? This is what happens. This is why some of you, you feel like God moves upon your life and then you never feel like what God put in your heart, you can't seem to carry it out because you're spending all your time trying to figure out how you're going to make it work. When nobody really listening. I saw some people looking down. I need to back up. You're constantly trying to figure out how you're going to make it work. How am I going to get my Bible time in? What are they going to say? What are they going to do? Listen, there's a difference between worry and concern. Because you should have concern. Things should concern you. But worry, the main way to tell whether it's worry or concern is remember this. Worry brings stress, anxiety, and panic. Mm -hmm. Trying to figure it out. Why? Because I'm stressed about it. Got to fix it. <laughs> Worried about it. What are they going to say? Panic. Got to do something quick. No time to waste. Jesus is coming tomorrow. <laughs> your panic, your worry, and trying to figure it out that the wheels turn because of worry actually hinders the kingdom of God going forward in your life. Worry is caused because of our insecurities. <clears throat> worry is insecurity driven. We're worried about things we cannot control. Yeah. Mm. I spend all day wondering 
what kind of mats I need to put on the floor so people can kneel and stay a little longer. It's going to match it. And I can spend all day worrying about that when actually I see plenty of people who are kneeling and sitting and on their face without any comfy cushion. Worry about color schemes, words on the screen. I spent probably an hour of time trying to figure out what kind of computer I can put back there that won't blank out the screen and won't freeze on the animations when we finally get something up there. I should have prayed for that hour because Jesus said, could you not watch and pray for an hour? Maybe God would just tell me about this one. <laughs> spend all the time worrying about things we can't control. Coronavirus. The vaccine. People are worried about this inauguration day and our president-elect and the president come that's going all this stuff and we're spending all our time watching the news, watching the stuff they're not putting on the news, trying to figure out, well, what are we going to do? If this happens or that happens, or they take away our freedom, listen here. They could come and tell us we couldn't meet here anymore. They can run us out of this building. They can lock us up in jail. But I can't worry about that because everywhere I go, I'm going to carry the seed of the kingdom. And if I don't let that type of worry choke out the kingdom, we'll have a Bible in the prison. And the guy that could potentially chop my head off for preaching the gospel, when that guillotine comes down and my head goes off, what if the Spirit of God hit that dude so hard because my life's a testimony that I love my life not unto death and that guy that dropped is the one that God takes and uses to actually bring the revival forth that I've called Amen. out to God for. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies. My family going, you know, we spend too much time worrying about what others are going to think. Listen, I should already probably had this building or a building like this a lot sooner than I did. When we started in that tent, it wasn't supposed to stay in the tent for the probably the duration that it did. And you know what? Pause me is when people begin to say things and misunderstand me and I was powerless really to defend myself. And so I had a fear that if I continued on, I'd fit my life would fit their narrative. Would you say that God may would have needed a Sunday night revival hub meeting a year and a half ago? My worry. What if I had still let my worry and I'd have held on to what I was going to do and just going to travel and just do these tents and just try to make it fit where I don't fit the narrative of being the bad guy. How many people would not be delivered in this house? Some of you are worried about, well, I have this ministry, I have this dream, God's, and you're just worried about being rejected by your family, by your spouse, by whoever, you know, maybe your pastor. Listen, I've been rejected by pastors before. Listen, you got to quit worrying about it. That's right. You can't control what they say about you, what they'll do to you. Because right now, it will. if you do not overcome that worry, it will choke out the seed of revival that God's planted in your heart tonight. That's right. The second thing that needs to be uprooted is the deceitfulness of riches. No one can serve two masters. He will love one and hate the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Some translate it as money. I like the way that Robert Morse puts it. He said, mammon isn't money. Mammon is the spirit that's on money if your money is not dedicated to God. There's nothing wrong with wealth. Doesn't Deuteronomy tell us it is the Lord your God who gives you the power 
to get wealth. I, mean, I loved it when I went and preached at Brother Richie's for the first time. He had some declarations. He says, can you just say this right now? I'm in a wealthy place. Because nobody likes to be broke. You can't bless nobody. You can't do nothing if you're broke. But let me tell you, there is a deceit that comes with wealth and riches if you're not careful. Let me tell you this. Money is a tool, not an answer. Because, my God, because money, if it was the answer, what happens when you finally get the money you said was the answer, but you still have the problem? Here's what you got to understand about riches. Jesus said the deceitfulness of riches or wealth, the word deceit, Simply means to trick. Charge your phone. Yes, sir. Damn, whatever. Actually, we rebuke the devil in the name of Jesus right now. I probably do. In fact, they're recording. I probably need to charge that thing. But deceit is the trick. Deceitful means it's misleading. If I have, I mean, how many of you have had this thought? If I only had X amount of money. Yeah. I used to think that all the time. And then guess what? When I got X amount of money, guess what I started thinking? If I only had X amount of money. It's misleading. The, the way that 20 bucks would leave my pocket is now the way that 200 now seems to leave my pocket. <laughs> I missed that, but I'm sure it was good. <laughs> Whatever I said. Tell you what, I thought, man, I got, I'm blessed. Started walking in abundance. The next thing I know, my kids are teenagers and banged and wrestling and football. You know, that stuff's expensive. There goes the money. <laughs> Revival Hub at the beginning, not many offers coming in. There, there goes the money. You got to understand that. Money is a tool, not an answer. Because the way that you squander $2 is the way you'll squander 20 And the way that you squander 20 is the way you'll squander 200 And the way you squander 200 is the way you'll squander 2000 And 2000 you if you squander 2000 you squander 20000 If you squander, you'll squander 20000 you'll squander 200000 and the way you squander 200000 is the way you'll squander a million. Yeah. The reason why some of us wonder why the, the promise of God about an open heaven and pouring out blessings has not come is because God knows that your heart can't handle it because you'll right. just right. squander. It's God's protection. Right. Yeah. For years I'd give the missions. I'd so, 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 so. And I'm like, God, why? Where is it? And then about three years ago, all of a sudden, I'm like, blessings, blessings, blessings. Where did this come from? Because it was waiting until my heart could handle it to help fund the kingdom. It's interesting that the whole time I thought I'd never be doing anything like this, and it's actually the one thing I was really called to do. And guess what? When I got to that point to begin moving that direction, then here come the open heaven for the finances to fund the kingdom. Because right now, if God gave you what you think you needed, you would squander it on a vehicle you don't need right now. Can I tell you, I used to look at these four-door, four-wheel drive trucks. I mean, well, look on the internet, marketplace, be looking, because I always wanted a, a bigger truck. I'm a family around, so we can go do this and that and everything. And I was had in my mind to buy it for me to do things, certain things, whether they were fun. And, well, guess what? When I finally got that four-wheel drive, four-door pickup truck, actually, a year before I got it, guess what? I had a dream that I bought it from a certain dealership, from a certain salesman, it's the color of the truck I have now. And a year later, I got it. And you know what's interesting about that truck? I got it for about 10 grand less than the MSRP on it. It was used, but it was used as a demo on the lot. They brought it to me with 4,000 miles on it, only a year old. And you know what's crazy is that truck was, from the salesman I got it from, the longest trip that truck ever took was from Jonesboro, Arkansas, to the prison near Texarkana, Texas, for him to go in and share his testimony how God brought him out of drugs, and he carried a bunch of gifts with prisoners in the back of that truck and drove it into the prison for a while. Drives it back to Jonesboro. The day they brought it to my house from Jonesboro, I'm in there signing the papers for the truck in my living room. 
The guy packs up, gets in my old truck that I had for trading. They go back to Jonesboro. I'm loading these speakers and these monitors up because we have revival service that night. The first trip I took in that truck was hauling my revival equipment. So my wife saw me. I was hauling these big tents around and stuff. I'm like, you need an upgrade. It's that little straight six cylinder I had in that Ford. It was barely cutting it. Now I got stuff I can haul tables and chairs and revival equipment. Went to Louisiana that year. My truck, it drove it all the way down there. I don't think that little red truck would have made it down there. What am I saying? The abundance comes at the right time for you to step into your kingdom purpose and advance the kingdom of God on the earth. Amen. But don't think, man, if I just had this, it's misleading, it's deceitful. Yeah. It's interesting how the, that Jesus said there's the three things that choke you out. First one is the cares of this world, the worries of life, which are founded on your insecurity. And the next one's on the deceitfulness of riches, because if you think you have a certain amount of money, you'll finally be secure. Wow. Insecurities. Insecurities is a false security. If you read the Amplified Bible, it says the false glamour and security that comes with riches. The American dream, I couldn't say any better. I actually had that thought, but didn't write down my notes. Brother Paul just preached it. The American dream. The car, the house. Gotta have the dog. All those things, the house, the dog, the one, everything, the kids. Can I tell you, I, you know, you know, I got this dream in my heart that I'm going to have this house one day. It's going to have this rock fireplace. I'm going to have the TV above the mantel. Well, now it's going to have my cup of coffee with my caramel macchiato shake mixed in with that coffee. Getting healthy. Watching the Razorbacks play on a cold Saturday afternoon after I kill that eight point buck out back. Isn't that right, Brother Gary? Come on. Son. And I can just picture the peace that there I can just veg out watching the game and I'm having my cup of joe and all this stuff. But listen. I was listening to a podcast and my favorite preacher was kind of sharing almost, it's like he knew my, my dream was like we were, and like he's sharing that same kind of scenario. And you know what the Lord spoke to him? What if I want to create that on the inside of you? How does it get created? When we uproot the deceitfulness of riches, we uproot the worries of this life and let the seed of the kingdom, which is revival, produce that in us. Third thing is just simply the desire for other things. I know of a pastor that literally told somebody that was going to start a church so I'm going to tell you how this needs to work. I'm going to tell you right now. You need to know this. Long services do not work. Y'all laugh. But it really did happen. He said, it doesn't matter if you're there one hour or three hours. God will do the same thing. What if I cut it off in 30 minutes? Would there have been deliverance that took place? Uproots. You'd have been into a place where you could receive from the Spirit of God. Yeah. Wow. The desire for a normal church. Because normal church fits within the American dream. You have your hour on Sunday, go home, eat your chicken, and yeah. drink your sweet tea, kick it back for the rest of the day. That's right. Fits into the American hobbies. Binge watching Netflix will choke out the seed of revival. And here's the thing. It would be different if it was an occasion. But for so many of us in here, it's in abundance. Hobbies. Vacations. The abundance of always looking for the next day off, the next free thing, the next free load. Yeah. 
Yeah, the devil doesn't sound an alarm because there's some people that are on fire now about to go out here and they're uprooting. Hmm. Yeah. 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 I remember right before, I think it was in 2018, I actually said this from a pulpit in McGee, Arkansas. I said, man, I never spend another day on a Saturday vegging out watching college football and ignore my study. And you know what? I have not. I cannot remember the last time I spent a whole day vegging out watching college football because God uprooted it. I'm like, like, that's my wife. Like, that's something we used to love to do. We, I didn't think we sat down and watched an entire game. It's like every time we sit down, the national championship game is the last Monday night. I said, I'm going to sit down. How many interruptions did I have? I had to pause, 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 and then all of a sudden it didn't save my pause. It skipped. A, it didn't mess up the Tebow, and I missed like half the, the the third quarter or whatever. It didn't matter anyway. Alabama kicked tail. But can I just have one game, baby? God said, no, you can't have one game because you matured to another level. You can't go back to that. Amen. Maybe that's the idea. The very thing that's frustrating us with our hobbies and our relaxation days. You're like, well, why can't I just have a day? Because God doesn't want you to have one anymore because it's now his life in you. Right. People that have been in this ministry from the beginning know I've preached this, that many want the pleasure of revival, but not the responsibility. Own it in the Bible. Had a brother that died. His wife was left behind. Had no kids. And according to the tradition of that time, they had to. That brother owned it. Had to take his brother's wife and come together with her so she could get pregnant and carry on, have kids for the brother that was dead. Wow. And you know what the Bible says that owned it when he came together with his brother's wife that he spilled his seed on the ground. That's in your Bible. For those of you who don't know what seed is, it's his sperm. It's filled on the ground. It's in the Bible. And the Bible says it angered God and God struck him dead. Why? Because it's the same thing that's going on in the church. We want the pleasure of God's presence, the do that. The but then when he tries to impregnate you with a call and a responsibility, you spill the seed on the ground. Desire for other things. I wish I knew who said this. I had the name before, but I've lost it, but I have the quote. So this is not coming from me. This is coming from somebody who said this, but they said this. And it's a great quote. It's true. Which, I don't want to say this. I don't know if it's completely true, because I still believe that there's hope for revival. But listen to what this man of God said. He said, I see no hope for revival among God's people today. They are so enamored and cluttered up with Hollywood and newspapers and magazines and parties and bowling alleys and camping trips and everything else. How in the world are they going to get still long enough to see anything from God? Wow. The desire for other things. Let me tell you this tonight. The desire for other things that you have in your life may not be a bad thing. There is something very refreshing about taking a day and spending it on in the woods in a deer stand, whether I see a deer or not. There's something that does something to me. Yeah. There are days where you need to take a day and do nothing. You need to sit in your recliner, maybe take your nap, drink your coffee. But here's the thing. We've made idols out of those things. We have those things in abundance. And we have to uproot if we long for God as much as we long for the day off, we would probably already have revival in this nation. Amen. And listen, all these things we mentioned, the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the desire for other things, they strangle. It's violent. The thing, these things, these desires, these things aren't, they play for keeps. They will scratch, they will claw, they will get nasty in your life. But the kingdom of God always suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. Would you stand with me tonight? Bethany, why don't you come?
you just lift your hands to the Lord? See, the Lord was calling out the things to be uprooted, but now you've got the wisdom and understanding of what God was actually doing in the Spirit. But maybe there's more things you see. If you walk out of here tonight and you find yourself being choked out by some of the things you thought were uprooted tonight, don't buy into the lie that God didn't really do something in your life. initiative. 